and welcome to Outlaws to the End, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com, the greatest gaming community in the world. This is the show where we talk in-depth about the titles and topics of the video game industry. I'm Brent Adams, joined as always by my co-host, co-writer, cohort, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren. Oh, that was that was you were throwing to me, Brent. <laughs> In fact, I was. It's, In that fact, was, I was. It was. It's so. It's so. It's so laid back. It's so. Listen, I could. I mean, I can do the old shouty shouty thing. I'm just telling you that it's gonna sound weird. It's gonna sound weird with that music coming in. <laughs> no, I know it is. You're so, gonna be like uh, all mellow and chill, and you know, listening to this kind of haunting, melancholy sort of tune, and then there's gonna be a fat guy screaming in your ear. And before Brent, we it are, worked, uh, but it wouldn't work. We now. Were, we're recording this the same day that you posted images of Tony, Daniel, yourself, and I uh, recording the last Outlaws to the End, discussing game trailers and the, its demise. That's true, yeah. Uh, and and people were just freaking out and talking about how much we suck at quitting. And they're right. Little do they right know that we're that. actually we're actually recording a third podcast, which may come out just uh, d- days after the yeah. Uh, the last one, and so here we are with episode three of Outlaws to the End. Uh, in the last what two weeks since we yeah, basically, basically we've had three shows and we've recorded three shows in two weeks. I, I don't know what the release schedule is going to end up being, but we've recorded three shows in two weeks. That's exactly right. But uh, we wanted Brent. We wanted to get on and talk about Firewatch. We did. Which uh, we wanted to talk about Firewatch is one of the few games, and I guess that we can go ahead and, and say we can go ahead and title this episode Post Mortem. Firewatch. That's right. We absolutely can. And uh, that being the case, we should start at the top, Brent, before we get into anything else. Yes. Just so it's said, this will be a spoiler-laden podcast about Firewatch. So if you do not want to hear about Firewatch, you probably shouldn't listen right now. That's exactly right. So uh, just with that out of the way, we'll go ahead and uh, let's give some vital information about Firewatch. Number one, this is a game that uh, was developed by Campo Santo. This is the first game. That uh, that they've developed and Campo Santo is filled with uh, some interesting uh, some interesting people. You've got Jake Rodkin and Sean Vanneman, who are the creative leads on The Walking Dead from Telltale Games. You've got Nels Anderson, the lead designer on Mark of the Ninja. You've got uh, Chris Remo, who uh, who composed the excellent score that I'm going to talk about. Uh, yep. Who who also worked with uh, Jake Rodkin and Sean Vanneman over on the uh, the Idle Thumbs podcast. And so there's this interesting mix of people who have worked on games, who have been game journalists, who have been game podcasters. Uh, also, uh, we need to mention Ollie Moss, who's, uh, who's an artist, I'm sure, that uh, is responsible for the, uh, the, very, the very striking visual style of Firewatch. But just to, just to give a little bit of background information on some of the people who created this game, this is a first-time effort from this studio, but obviously the experience uh, of the people behind it uh, goes back through, uh, through some pretty notable titles. Yeah, it's almost as if you and I made a video game, um, if only, only with some artistic merit. If you and I could um, come up with a way, here's the thing, Lauren. If you and I could come up with a way to make a video game that did not involve uh, any character animation, save for the first person perspective of the player avatar, that encompassed the the, the tone and feelings that we like from Red Dead Redemption. Maybe some of the absurdity of Borderlands, uh, the the kind of dramatic underpinnings of Journey, and I'm trying to I'm trying to think of you know some other things that we both like. But if we could find a way to do all those, we would make a video game. It's just that we don't know dick about programming. None of us. <laughs> we don't particularly possess have, a, have a strong artistic any background. of those skills. That's. <laughs> I could, That's, I could, we have design, no idea to I could design the web page for it. Uh, uh, I could write the script, but uh, beyond that, there's not I could much do that, more. I, yeah. I, I think. I mean, we, I, we could write something probably. I think. I think the closest we could get is is we could write something, and then you might be able to film me holding up the script, right? Uh, and that's about as close as we could get. Yeah, that's probably true. I could I could film you holding up a keyboard and like you know pretending like oh I'm coding like you know, like, <laughs> like you know how like kids in TV series like they they start hacking and they just like start furiously typing on a keyboard like at 300 words a minute like that. Yes, I'm almost positive that's not what hacking looks like. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, so Campo Santo, yeah, it is. But, it is but an enough of, group of our of, failure. Let's talk about Campo it, it Santo's is, It is an interesting group of guys. So, um. 
Brent, so this is this is interesting. This is again, we've moved to this sort of free form podcast and the first iteration of it, um, we sort of you and I were talking about games that, that the other one had not played. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of interviewed each other, and people said they kind of liked that. Right. The second podcast, completely different, yep. was uh, the return of uh, one Daniel Kaiser and one Tony Grice, TG in 3D, uh, and that was just really just a, a just a, a mess, basically. Basically, is what it was. yes, it was it was a hot mess. But uh, uh, so today we're talking about but one game we're doing nice. a post mortem. I mean, it, can't deny <laughs> it, that it smelled good. It did. Um, but uh, uh, so let me start you off here, Brent. Sure. Uh, overall. Um, First of all, to start off with, you played this on the PC, correct? That's right, and you played it on the PlayStation yeah. Four. I played it. We're going to talk a, a lot about that, yeah, actually. People, but I played it on the. Go ahead, sir. I, I played it on the PlayStation Four initially, mm-hmm. uh, and and then played it on the PC. Yeah, uh, people in my Twitch stream this morning uh, were were saying that they were making predictions. I, I said that you and I were going to talk about Firewatch on an episode, and and they were making predictions about what you might say. And people said uh, they were anticipating sentences including the words PlayStation 4, the word fundamentally, and then broken so, in some combination. And uh, <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, uh, there's, I, that's I, a reasonable I, guess. I said that if there, if there were a betting pool, they're probably not going to get too many takers against. That's a reasonable guess, but there's going to be much more than that. So right. I started out on the PlayStation 4 and played on the PC, but we'll talk about okay. that. So, so you played it on the PC. I did. I, I, I want to start off with... Uh, in, um, and I should say that it, my, my copy of Firewatch was a gift. My, my copy of Firewatch was a gift from a listener from, uh, from Aaron B., who was very, very kind uh, to, uh, to donate to me and, and, and just said, I, I'd love to see you stream this. And, uh, and so I did. I, I, I not only played on the PC, but I streamed the entire experience. Uh, on Twitch, which is not really that much of a feat, seeing as how the entire experience was about four hours. Um, so overall, I'm curious to know if you liked it, first of all. Yes, I did. Uh, I did like Firewatch. Not a perfect game. There's things about it that there's things about it that I felt were, uh, that I was let down by, and there's things about it that I, I thought were maybe a, a bit of a missed opportunity, which I suppose those two things aren't all that distinct from each other, but uh, I did like Firewatch, and I... I enjoyed it more in the moment than I did at the conclusion. Uh, I, I think is, is is how I would put it. I I really really got into certain things that were happening during the game, particularly the the mystery, the the intrigue, and the paranoia that the game explores uh, during the uh, during the course of play. Those things were really compelling to me, and I thought that the game did a really really wonderful job of of laying out those breadcrumbs for you and, and really incentivizing you to, to try to unravel the mystery. I think where the game failed was not in necessarily in giving you an answer, although one could argue that giving you an answer was a mistake, but I think that, I think that, uh, that the, what the end ultimately represented uh, was a bit of a letdown, even though, as I'll talk about uh, once we kind of get into this in more depth, I respect the ending for what it is, and I think that the ending is, it really rings true to what Firewatch is trying to be as a title, but ultimately the ending uh, did fall, and it, it just fell a little bit flat for me. So that's interesting. So um, if I were to take that same question and turn it on myself, I yes, would have w- to well, say that. Why don't we try? Lauren, did you like Firewatch? Um, you know, it's interesting, Brent. I'm glad you asked me yeah, that. Yeah, um, that's actually a very hard question for me to answer. And, and again, we'll get into this in a little bit, but I, but, but the, the, the ways in which the PS4 version were fundamentally broken. Oh, bingo. Uh, <laughs> um, I get the door prize. Is it a drinking game? I wish. Uh, the, the ways, uh, the, uh, unfortunately the, the technical issues that the PS4 version has, yeah. uh, and we'll talk about it, uh, really impacted my relationship to the game. I'm not surprised to hear um, that. In, in a very significant way, and in, in this game, much more so than I think in, a, in many games that I've played. So I played through uh, about three quarters of the game. So so I played through about the first hour of the game and decided it was unplayable. I had written, I had exchanged um, conversations on Reddit yeah. with Sean Vanneman um, about concerns around the PS4 version and, and, and questioned, you know, the idea of putting a game out and that's just that's, just to be specific for the audience what issues were you experiencing uh, i know that there were like frame rate uh, problems stuttering things like that is that what yes, we're talking about that's what we're talking about okay. 
to the point of to the point of um, about every three feet that Henry walked in the games, yeah. the game was stuttering. Okay. So I mean, it was nonstop. Right. Um, and it did crash on me once in the beginning. After that, it never crashed, but it was nonstop stuttering and frame rate issues. Okay. So, um, so Sean had said prior to the game's release that 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 while they recognized there were technical issues, he said this to me on Reddit. Um, he had played hundreds of hours in the game on PS4, and they would not have released it if it wasn't in a playable state. And they're intending to patch it. But if I have problems, to to write him is what he, to DM him on. On Reddit, and yeah. so I thought, okay, you know, the developer basically just said, "Write me if you have a problem, and we'll make this work." Yeah. So I thought that no harm, no foul. I'll buy the PS4, and he'll make it right if it's not good. So I bought the PS4 version. I played through an hour of it, and I said, "You know what? This is terrible." And I wrote Sean, and I said, "Hey, man, this is this is not working for me at all. It's ruining the game, and I'm really interested. Could you either facilitate a refund on the PlayStation Store or send me a Steam copy? Either either one." Yeah. Uh, and I didn't hear back for about 24 hours, and and was the next night and I had time and I was like, Oh, let me just sit down and try it again. And I, and I was drawn into the game enough that I played it for about another hour and a half, probably. So I played through a good, you know, two thirds or three quarters of the game. Uh, and then I stopped playing and Sean wrote me back a couple hours later and sent me a steam code. Okay. So I thought, all right, I'll download the steam code. You know, I said, thank you or whatever. I I thought I'll download the steam code. I downloaded the steam code. I thought I'll try, I'll fire it up for a couple minutes and I played the game for about 10 minutes and it was like it was like night and day. I mean, it was absolutely night and day. Yeah. Um. And, and not not just the performance was absolutely night and day, but like it just made the whole game feel differently. And I was suddenly seeing things that I couldn't see before. Mm-hmm. I never knew the entire. I played almost three hours of that game, if not three hours of the game, mm-hmm. and I never knew that you could see Delilah's um, tower. tower across the mountains. I never saw that on the PS4 version. Um, if you remember, there, there's a part in the game where you have to fi- you find a radio laying on the ground. I, I walked around for 25 minutes trying to find that radio. Um, and when I went to the PC version, obviously I knew it was there at that point, but it was very easy to see. Yeah. So, I mean, it really changed my relationship to the game in a big way. And so I thought, God damn it, I'm going to play it on the PC. So I then started the whole game over on the PC. Right. And I basically did a speed run through the first two-thirds of the game to get to the last third of the game or whatever. And so, and I ended up finishing, if you look on my steam account, mm-hmm. uh, it was about two hours and 40 minutes. It took me from beginning to end to play the game. Okay. Um, because I ended up speed running through the first two hours of it because I'd already played it. Yeah. Um, and I tried to make this mostly the same uh, dialogue choices because I wanted, didn't want yeah. things to change. Although Continuity. we'll talk about that too. I did make a couple of different ones, right. but so that in itself, that, that whole process like fundamentally changed uh, and there it is. Uh, fundamentally changed my rela- my my emotional relationship to the game, and so I don't think I enjoyed it as much as I could have. So you're you're um, saying that the experience of playing it on PlayStation Four uh, made made it uh, impossible or at least difficult for you to enjoy the game under any circumstances, even even where the game was running and looking good. Uh, I, I almost question whether or not if I would have just stayed with the PlayStation, if it would have been a level more level experience. Because as un, as as like annoying as it was, I was still playing it, and so I think I lost. I really lost out on some of the visual beauty yeah. and and splendor of the game. Um, but by by playing through it again, I think is what really I see. Yeah, I, I can really I can hurt that. my connection to the game and the ending and all that stuff and. <laughs> Did you know going in that uh, the PlayStation 4 version was having problems, or, or were you unaware? Oh, no, I knew. I mean, like I said, I talked to Sean about it on Reddit. Right. So, I mean, I knew, and, and, I, and the developer himself sort of reassured me that it shouldn't be that significant. Do you regret that decision? Do you regret getting it on the PlayStation 4 and not just biting the bullet and getting it on PC? I do. Uh, I mean, the reason, yeah, ultimately, yes, but I could only know that in retrospect, and I had a very specific reason to want to get it on the PS4. Yeah, you wanted to play with and your that, wife. Yeah, I wanted my. It's a game that I thought my wife would really enjoy. It's a type of game she would play. I thought, you know, there's not a lot of experiences that that are really built well for us to share together. And I thought this would be a. a I was really looking forward to this and Unravel as experiences that we could share together. Probably, probably the only two this year. So I really, I was invested in having it on the consoles for that reason. So, yeah. um, but it just didn't work out. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't. Think it would, based on what Sean said to me, I didn't think it would be as bad as it was, but but it was. So yeah. when you ask me if I like the game, the answer is I think the game has 
uh, a lot of amazing qualities. I enjoyed it. I also think um, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, and we'll talk about that. But what I found really interesting, Brent, is I so I invited Sean to come on the show when I wrote him back about about the issues, right. and he hasn't responded to me. Um, and I don't know if he ever will, but, um, <laughs> but he's like, listen, uh, listen, chump, I've been on a real podcast. Okay. One of the thing, one of the things that I think is most interesting, and I think it's really interesting that about what you said at the top of the show yeah. is I wanted to ask him, did they really think it was necessary? Like, what was the conversation around having to include some sort of mystery in the game? Because the stuff that I found so compelling was the other stuff. It was the dialogue. It was it was all the stuff we'd seen so much of in, um, in the trailers. Uh, I really liked those moments, and I was wondering if they had talked about the idea of not having a mystery or that whole paranoia thing, and mm. and and having just a game that was mostly made up of like these types of conversation and moments. And I, I was let's, interested in playing that game. Let's talk about that because uh, you know my my experience with the game as everyone else's is as well at the very beginning, you are one of the best openings in video. Games, absolutely. In absolutely. One of the best video game openings I've ever played. And, and, and on the Twitch stream, amazing. I, I was just commenting as I, as I was playing about how, how evocative what I, what, what I was experiencing was. And I think that 50 lines or so, whatever that was. It's, it, yeah. It's a real Testament to, to minimalistic writing and, to really letting well into writing itself to, to to letting well specifically what I mean, and I think I think that it 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 really shows the the level of experience of the people involved because I think that uh, and the, I'm repeating myself from the Twitch stream, but um, I think that a novice writer spends all of this time imagining everything that's happening, and then they want to they want to share that with you. They they kind of want to show you like how clever they are and how deep their imagination goes. For, you know, for the material, you know, they've imagined every single detail, and so they have to share every single detail with you. And to have the restraint to to, to give you those very very small passages that that are not all that descriptive, but are, are more declarative, and then letting your imagination fill in the descriptions, letting your imagination uh, work work in all of the details. Uh, it, it was profound. It, it, it did a fantastic job of the game kind of reaching out to you and you kind of reaching out to the game and, and meeting in the middle and creating the fiction uh, that is the prologue for this game together. And that prologue is very, very compelling. And the game is full of, of what, what I affectionately call kitchen sink drama. Uh, the relatable kinds of drama that, that all human beings uh, can, can engage with because they reflect uh, facets uh, of our lives that that all of us have experienced, and the the prologue to the game, the 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 tale essentially of Henry and Jules, is is fantastic, and it's it's about these two people uh, meeting under unlikely circumstances, forging a relationship, building a life together, and then one of those big one of those big road bumps comes along, and 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 Jules is offered a really really good job two thousand miles away, and how do you how do, how do you deal with that? And, and it reminded me specifically uh, of, of, a, of a couple that I was friends with, my wife and I. They were some of our best friends. And this exact thing happened to them. And it ended up, their relationship ended over it. Uh, because uh, one of them was offered uh, a job really far away and, and wanted to take it. And the other person didn't want to go. And that's, you know, so like, I mean, it's as relatable as anything. Uh, the only way it could be more relatable is if it happened to me, I guess. Well, I think that's one of the most interesting things about the opening. Well, there's there's a couple things. The writing is, and it was almost like a checklist of it, but yeah. the dog, the relationship, mm-hmm. the the marriage, the children conversations. I mean, it was so, uh, it, it was so relatable, which is what makes it so powerful. Yeah. It also was interesting uh, the way that they gave the player some agency in the conversation. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought, and it's interesting how how the player agency does not give you complete freedom. But only the sort of the freedom to choose within what they, you, you know, with, with, within the, the latitude of what they deem Henry as a character to be interested in choosing. Which is, yeah, it was, so which, which kind which of, is kind of selfish. Like, like the choices that, like, that it comes down to when it's like, okay, so Jules is going to move 2,000 miles away and your choices are either beg her not to go or tell her she can go but she has to commute. But right. at no point is there a choice for you to go with. Right. You know, that's interesting. 
They were interesting, and they were they were very binary. The dog one I thought was really interesting, very telling yeah. about you know do you, do you take the like which so which dog did you take? I, first I, of all? I, I chose the dog that she wanted. Uh, she wanted me to too, have. as did I. But I think it's an interesting like do you take the badass German Shepherd that right. you know you want, or do you take the Beagle that you have no interest in, but well, it's what your wife well, wants? Well, that's the thing. You know, it's like I'm coming into this. You know, I, I I've been in a long term relationship with my wife, and I that's exactly I right. understand I understand the ebb and flow and, and the give and take of you, you know like when somebody really. You know, when, when she really wants something, when something's like really important to her, you know, then I can, I consider that as opposed to, you know, she says the word dog and I'm like, I want a German shepherd, you know, that's right. which is that's the more exactly. sort of like younger selfish version of me, I guess. Yes, that's exactly right. So I thought it was, and the music was, was, uh, just absolutely brilliant. fantastic. Brilliant. Full stop. The music in this game is brilliant. It's one of the best. Let's just pause for a second and say this here. Chris Remo has composed one of the best video game soundtracks I have ever listened to in my life. I, I've, I've purchased the soundtrack. I listened to it. I've listened to it many times while I've been working on things. or just had it on in the background. It's amazing. Uh, you can find it. You can get it on Steam, but you can if you go to uh, if you go to a Campo Santo, they've got links. You can get it through Bandcamp. You can preview the whole yep. album. You can get it. For, you can name your price six dollars or more. I paid more, and um, and you can get like you know really high quality versions of it. I cannot even if you have no interest in Firewatch whatsoever. I cannot emphasize enough how much you should go and listen to the soundtrack i think it's brilliant yeah the only problem with the soundtrack i, I agree with you brian it's up there with transistor and journey um to me in, to me among, which is interesting that i think probably uh red dead is also pretty high up there for me yeah, as well but yeah, um a couple you know a lot of my greatest uh hits of best m- scores are are in indie games for for whatever reason but the only issue i had at all with the soundtrack is i wanted more of it i wanted Why? I, I wanted more of it. I wanted it in more places in the game. There were times when I, and not that it had to be everywhere, and certainly that that idea of the isolation and being out in nature, um, and we'll talk about that. But uh, there were definitely times when I was like, God damn, the soundtrack would go great right here. Yeah. Or I haven't, I haven't heard music in a while, and I'd really like to hear some some soundtrack over this. Um, but it is it is phenomenal, and and it starts out right in the beginning mm-hmm. with that with with that opening, and it's just and and the use of the sounds which. When I, when I played it again on the PC and I had my headphones on, uh, I was able to detect a lot of sounds in more detail, like the clinking of the glasses and that sort of thing sure, yeah. that I hadn't heard that I heard, but I, that I weren't as resonant uh, as they were. Um, they weren't as resonant on the t- coming out of the TV as they were on the, um, uh, through the headphones. And it was just, it's just one, honestly, one of the best openings in video games. I, I agree. It, it's, it was really impressive. I, I, as I was experiencing it, I was saying some of these things that we're, we're saying right now because it really, really stood out uh, to me and impressed me. I th- and then you come out of that into the world. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, the next time that uh the next time, you know, you're 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 hopping in your truck, uh there's there's a cut scene like where you're coming out of an elevator, you're hopping in your truck and then you know you're getting out of your truck and you're you're uh, you're on your way to uh to the to the the tower that's going to kind of become your home away from home. And I think that I think that one of the things that's kind of relevant to say here uh, is to is to reemphasize what I, I said earlier about this game being kitchen sink drama and and being very relatable. The, the The drama of the game is very very grounded. Um, there as as opposed to video games, which very often peddle in in elements of the fantastic, uh, the the supernatural, the the mythological. You know, video games often deal in a lot of over-the-top subject matter. And uh, this this game is on the other side of the scale. Very, very grounded, very, very relatable drama, very relatable action. The things that are exciting in this game are things that you and I could very well experience. The things that are, the things that, that, that you know, that fill you with tension and anxiety are things that you and I very well could experience if, if we were placed in similar circumstances. And the likelihood of you and I being in similar circumstances is much, much higher than it is you and I being in similar circumstances to Nathan Drake or something like that. Um, well, I'll speak for yourself on that one. <laughs> so anyway, I think that a lot of the design decisions about the game were down to, we want to have a game that has some action, in quotes, uh, a sense of adventure, some drama, but we want to we want to to pull all that back into a realm where it feels real and relatable and not kind of 
you know, cross over that threshold into the the arena of high adventure where most video games live. Well, and certainly, so so uh, we should we should before we actually get into the game, we should talk about the end of the beginning, which is you know the the sort of the part of the drama that really sets up the story is that Jules. Oh, that's uh, yeah, your, yeah, yeah, right. Your wife develops Alzheimer's at uh, at a young age, yeah. and she advances to the point where she doesn't know what's happening, and you're her full time caretaker. You're not able to handle it. Um, you get you get end up getting a DUI because you go out drinking. You leave her in the house alone. Go out drinking. You get a DUI. You tell Jules sister, your sister in law, yeah. and her family basically comes and takes her from. Boulder, Colorado, which is where you live. Back to Australia, uh, where she's from. Back to Australia. And so she goes back to Australia with her family, um, uh, ostensibly fully involved in, in Alzheimer's and dementia. And you take this job uh, for the summer up in the mountains of Wyoming, being a fire watchman, uh, just doing nothing but sitting in a, an elevated cabin watching, looking for forest fires. And so yeah. the, the drama, this is, you know, this is a, 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 we've talked about this before, Brent. We talked about it with Ether One. For me, this is probably the one of the most poignant subject matters that that anybody could pull out. I my, I think I told you before my grandfather had Alzheimer's. Right. Uh, it was it was it was seven or eight years from the time he was diagnosed till he actually died, and it was just I mean brutal, just brutal watching him lose his his every ounce of what made him him. Yeah. Uh, you know, over the course of those seven years, and it's a, it's a absolutely. Uh, brutal disease, and just to think about that, you know, this in this young marriage, uh, this it, it's it's always devastating. But to think about it when they were just starting out, having kids, and that sort of thing, right? Uh, so that's that's uh, that's the drama that sets this up, or the, or the foundation that sets up sets this up, mm-hmm. and that's sort of the tenor of the opening, right? Is this very personal, very intimate, very grounded story, as you say, and this is why, and it continues like that that feeling the first. I don't know. What do you think? Hour maybe? Um, you're really just kind of, kind of walking around and talking with Delilah, your boss, the other forest ranger, right. about things. And the, the 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 relationship between Henry and Delilah is a really important one in the game and a very profound one. I think that, I think that again, we we come to in in the interchange between Henry and Delilah, particularly during that first hour or two of play. It is, it is some of the best writing I've ever seen. It's some of the best acting I've ever seen yep. in, in gaming. It is, it is so real. It is so relatable. We, you know, there are times when we're like, we're, or we're all wishing that, uh, that, you know, we could, we could think of something clever to say and we really can't. And you can play Henry that way. Or, you know, sometimes you will be able to, you know, say something back that's really clever. But Delilah is, she's a really great character. She's, she's very intelligent. She's very flirtatious. She's, you know, she's got a wicked, wicked sense of humor and, you know, it, it's, it's almost impossible to not kind of be drawn into that relationship and to, and, and to want to see some sparks fly between Henry and Delilah and, and to kind of play the game that way. They invite you so effortlessly to, to, to engage yourself in that relationship. And they do this almost immediately after coming off of you know the the events you've just described with with Jules uh, going back to Australia and and Henry kind of being in this state of limbo about his about his marriage, which you know it's it's just this big question mark. Again, it's interesting the way that they it's interesting the way that they allow you to play Henry, where you know they don't give you the option to really be platonic a hundred percent of the time. Or, okay, maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe. I no, they back. do because that's I played him that so way. So you played him platonic the entire time. I wasn't interested in in I didn't respond to any of her any of her advances because I couldn't I was thinking of my own wife right. and I just thought and I believe me again I I I've watched uh, a couple people in my life now die over slowly yeah. uh and, and I I and have to and have caretakers and that sort of thing and I would never in a million years would I begrudge a human being who is caring for their loved one who is demented or unconscious for years on end or whatever, I would never begrudge somebody in that role uh, developing another relationship, be it sexual or emotional or whatever, because um, because uh, everybody needs hu- human touch. Everybody needs companionship. Um, and, 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 and 
everybody needs that on a regular, normal basis. People that are in the position to have to be caregivers to uh, terminally ill uh, loved ones are are so stressed or emotional that that they more than anybody need a shoulder to cry on or somebody to touch them. And so I would never ever begrudge that of somebody. Right. So, so however, it wasn't a judgment call is what you're saying. At, but but for me, all I could think about was was my actual wife, um, and I I had no interest in engaging in that part of the the relationship at all. That's interesting. You know, I I never really invested myself all that much. In, in what was going on. Like I, like I was not, you know, sort of uh, imagining myself as Henry and, and, and Jules as my wife or anything like that. And, and part of that could be because I was playing this game live on Twitch in, in, in front of spectators. But for me, I really approached it as, as a story that I was helping to drive and I thought, what would be an interesting storytelling choice? And for me, the interesting storytelling choice would be to have gone through all of this this drama with this terrible situation between Henry and Jules, and then for Henry to meet this very, very uh, interesting and funny and an attractive human being. And and I thought that, you know, that would have that was a, a, re- a really interesting story to tell is sort of the okay, you know, hey, like, I'm, I'm interested in this, and yet at the same time, I've got all this baggage and all of this stuff that's going on from, from my marriage that's still unresolved. I thought that drama was very fun, and so I, I played in those waters. And See, Brent, I, have to, I want to interrupt you and say that even as we're talking about this, this is the part of the game that, that, was, that really was meaningful to me. And, and I'm, I want to separate this, the conversation we're having now from, from the other part of the game, which is this mystery... Yeah of walking back and forth and trying to solve, you know, what's going on. Right. Um, this is the kind of stuff that that's really interesting to me. And it would have been interesting if, if I could have played this stuff for another 90 minutes myself and been good with it. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't think that one comes at the detriment of the other, or at least that wasn't my experience in playing the game. Um, I really, really enjoyed the fact that the game has some element of, of mystery and 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 suspense to it. I, I really, really like that. I don't often feel that in games, and I love that. I love that feeling. You, you know, I'm not a fan of horror films, but I do love suspense and and mystery. You know, I, like Sherlock Holmes is you know like my favorite thing ever. And you know, like I've I've read like all the short stories. I've read the novels. I uh, I love the tension of a question. That hasn't been answered yet. No, I agree with and that, but I, so I, I, but I, but like what I'm saying is that like I don't. I'm glad that the game has both of these things. I'm glad that it didn't exclude one uh, for the other because they they both were really really enjoyable. Yeah, I, I don't, and I don't disagree with that. I but I do think maybe you said you said at the beginning of of what were you just saying that that what you were just saying. Excuse me. That one doesn't come at the detriment of the other, but, but I do feel like it did to to a degree because I feel like. Once you got further down the path of the mystery, yeah. the sort of more personal stuff fell by the wayside. The sort of more casual conversations, the getting no, to know it, each it other. The, mean, the, fo- the focus definitely shifted to that. But ultimately, again, like, I, the, thing that, the thing that I look back on, like, in that whole like, tension and drama that, that is going on about the mystery, it, it really comes down to some... To, to, the, a lot of that is fueled by some fundamental things like the the fact that Delilah lies in her official report about you know about that uh, that that event that happened um, yeah that bothered me you know and the fact that did that make you question your decision to flirt with her or to like to make her less attractive no it, it, it i don't think that it uh it definitely changed. It definitely changed my relationship with her, or, or Henry's relationship with her. It changed my <laughs> outlook on her. You know, right? And um, and I think I think I even said during the stream, I, I quoted that line from Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Uh, you know, where, where Richard Rome is talking to um, I, I can't I can't remember the character's name. Alan Arkin plays a character in the film version, but uh, he, you know, they're talking about uh, talking to the police about the break in in the office, and he says. Uh, he says, "I don't know what I'm going to tell him." He says, "Tell him the truth. It's the easiest thing to remember, you know." And um, 
and that's but that's the thing like that's a very relatable that's a very relatable piece of drama and like the, the, those are the things that I kind of come back to I kind of come back to that whole thing of like okay so she she lied a little bit to to make it seem like basically everything was kind of on the up and up and then suddenly they're in the situation where they might get caught in that lie and there might be some some relatively serious consequences to that and there's this whole question about you know th- these two these two girls who have disappeared these two girls that you were the last one to have seen these two girls who think that you trashed their camp and and destroyed some of their stuff and and you know there's, there's this pattern of behavior here that that you the player know or you think you know that you're not involved with and yet from the outside looks very very suspicious and very very damning and i love all that i love all of that stuff and then you know like kind of the deeper that you go into it and the more sort of conspiratorial it becomes uh i think the more interesting it gets and i think the game is actually saying something very very profound and important about our tendency our being human beings our tendency to imagine uh, vast conspiracies and and plotting against us that's uh, that's an easy thing to fall into. People do it a whole lot uh, around you know big tragic events in history and and things like that. But they also do it in in their in their personal lives. And I think that the the game kind of makes an interesting statement saying that ultimately uh, ultimately conspiracies are probably far less complicated than you imagine they are. And in this case, the game's conspiracy kind of boils down to this this guy, Ned, I can't remember, Goodwin, right? Ned Goodwin? Yep. This guy who is a little bit like Henry and Delilah in the sense that he's a guy who who made a mistake. The severity of the mistake, we don't really know. That That's left up in the air a little bit. But Ned was, he was a fire watchman himself. His son was out there with them. Delilah did not report the fact that he had a child out there, even though that was uh, that was not kosher, and um, and the kid ends up dying, as you find out during the course of this game. There's a lot of talk about the Goodwins and about what might have happened to Brian, and and the hope is that you know Ned was kind of an odd guy and that he just basically walked off his post, took Brian with him, and they're living, you know, relatively happily ever, ever after somewhere else. But of course, that's not what happened. What happened is Brian, as because you find his body at the bottom of that cave, you find out that Brian is dead. That Brian apparently fell uh, in a climbing in a accident. climbing accident, and he died. And Ned went off the reservation. And Ned is, has basically been living out in the Shoshone National Forest, scavenging batteries and food and supplies and all those kinds of things basically hiding from the consequences of that event and whatever his role may have been, whatever, whatever his culpability may be. Right. Well, he, and it, it, he's hiding the way you made it, the way you worded it made it sound like he did it. And, the, and he, his claim well, is there that there is a question. That, I mean, that's like, he no, says, no, no, he I didn't, agree with you. No, no, right. There's a question, but the way you said it kind of, to me made it sound like he actually did it. And he claims that, that it was it was a genuine falling accident, right. but he knew based on his history uh, that that he would end up yeah. you know going to jail for it, regardless of what the reality was, which in in his mind was that he didn't do right. it. Of course, but of course, um, you know that's the thing is like he brought his son out into the wilderness where he shouldn't have been a child. He put his son into that circumstance, and well, and he recognizes that. I mean, he said his son wasn't ready, right? You know, like he recognizes an amount of of sort of. Um, you know h- how he may have contributed to the accident, but in Ned's mind, it, it, it still it was an accident. Right. You know, but he but, but he, he he knows he's going to face he, consequences. He, right, that basically he would be charged with murder. Yeah, or something like that. And so, um, uh, yeah, I you know it's interesting because there's a, there's there's a lot of talk about um, you know, the theme of paranoia, yeah. um, and and as you said, conspiracy and. Um, there's a lot of people who were disappointed in the ending. Yeah, um, I, I I was not disappointed in the ending. Well, I, I think I understand why they're disappointed because I think that ultimately, and this is what I was saying at the very top. Ultimately, the ending the ending says 
that all the conspiracy and the paranoia and everything has been Ned Goodwin out in the wilderness fucking with you, essentially. Basically fucking with you and trying to discourage you from digging any deeper because he doesn't want to be found. And, and I mean, like, like really at its core, like, like when you just sort of take it in the broad brush strokes, it's a fucking Scooby-Doo mystery. You know, it's old man Goodwin, uh, who, whose son died and he's kind of like, you know, out in the woods with a spooky ghost mask or something like that, trying to scare you out of the area so that you don't dig any deeper and find out what he's really up to. I, I mean, I mean, at its core, that is essentially what the game says is going on. And on the one hand, that's kind of unsatisfying because the grandeur of the conspiracy and, and, the, and the potential for everything that might be happening there, the fact that you know, there, there's government uh, researchers involved and you know, there's all of this like high-tech radio interception equipment. Right, which is a total red herring. There, there's all this Area 51 stuff. Of course, you know, I was rooting for it to be Bigfoot. It's never Bigfoot. And, <laughs> and, and all of the, you know, they, they, build, they build up the expectation to where it gets like, oh man, like the it, missing could be, girls, it could be yeah. you know, an alien base you know, buried in Wyoming and all this stuff. And then ultimately it comes down to, no, it was just a guy who was, who was purposely trying to frighten you so that he himself, uh, you know, to, to deflect basically detection of himself and, and this event that happened to him. And so on the one hand, I respect that because it stays very, very true to the spirit of the game and that grounded and relatable drama. The, the fact that you know, this is a more true-to-life situation than an alien base hidden under a mountain. But, so it, it adheres to sort of the realism of the game, but it is not as dramatically satisfying as if it had gone bigger and better. And the, the thing that the statement that I made in the stream is that I felt the compromise would have been to have left the question open ended, to have left these left like breadcrumb trails pointing in different directions. One of those directions might have been it was Ned Goodwin fucking with you. One of those directions might have been that there was some sort of bizarre conspiracy going on that you guys were participating in, you know, some sort of psychological study that the government in conjunction with a, a university was conducting just to see how people in isolation respond to paranoia. And then yet another could have been that, uh, that this is all, this is all in your head and that you are, you are conjuring a lot of this because the game does open the door for that in that scene where you, well, and up- you could have left the girls also sort of undiscovered. And so that you could have left it such, such that that, maybe had something to do That's with true. it or yeah, not, yeah. or you don't know. I mean, that, That's true. that didn't need to be wrapped up in its neat little bow. That could have been a separate third sort of branch out, Very and true. I agree with you. And I, but, and, and I think had they... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna, just just to finish the point, uh, the game allows for things to happen that you, the player, experience that objective third parties later say didn't happen. You know, it, it allow, you know in, that, in that conversation, you wake up in the middle of the night and there's a phone call from Jules that, you know, is coming over the radio. And then, and you, you go through that and you think like, okay, you know, like I'm having this conversation. She's having a, a lucid moment. She wanted to get in touch with me. So now we're talking. And then you find out later, no, it didn't really happen. You were sleepwalking. So the game at that point, it opens the door for you to experience things that are not real. And so, oh, that's interesting because I didn't interpret that. I never interpreted the scene that way. Um, I, I knew immediately that he was, that he was, that he was dreaming or that he was missing. I mean, I thought, cause, cause. Because it starts out as her voice, as as Delilah's voice, and yeah. so I immediately interpreted that as like Delilah called, and he like half woke up and was hearing Jules's voice in his head, and then she says the next day, you know, I called you last night, and all I could all I could hear you say was you were mumbling Jules, right. like that. I mean, because the, my wife does that actually a little bit in that, like I'll wake her up in the middle of the night, and she'll have, we'll have a conversation three or four sentences long. Yeah. She'll have no recollection whatsoever of that conversation, and I've so that too. I immediately that, connected. That's usually that. when that I ask her about spending money. It's like, hey, listen, I'd really like to buy a new computer. <laughs> what do you think? That scene did not stand out to me in any way, shape, or form. But um, and I think if they had done what you said, Brent, they could have been a little bit less heavy-handed with the with the in, unless you know the unless the themes that they were going for were isolation and paranoia. But again, I feel like it was, you know, I. But it, and it can't just be isolation and paranoia because they were pretty heavy on the theme of like love and loss and relationships and your your you know relationship to like your your wife and how does that play out if if something like this happens and there's another very intelligent very attractive woman 
Um, and so there, there was there was much more thematically going on here than just isolation and paranoia. Yeah, that's true. But I feel like I feel like it was very much um, um, like first third emotion relationship love mm-hmm. loss right. second third isolation beginnings of paranoia and last part paranoia yeah and then the very last part uh the last like 15 minutes sort of wrap up yeah i, I mean that's something like if you look at it it actually follows it actually follows you know sort of um you know your your, your classic sort of three three act story structure in but I but I feel like even thematically it does. You're right. But I mean thematically, I feel like as opposed to, I mean I guess they were woven throughout. But but they they feel like almost distinct sections of the game. And I personally felt much more intrigued and connected to to the experience in the first part of the game yep. than I did in the uh, experience in say the last part of the game or whatever. In the beginning, it was like, oh, what is this stuff? It's kind of mysterious. It's interesting. And then, like you said, it sort of turns into this Scooby Doo mystery and. And and the stuff that I felt like was groundbreaking was the first hour. Right. I felt like that first hour was like was groundbreaking game making. I think that I think what what makes the uh, you know I, I don't like I don't value one of these over the other. I I, I really kind of take it all. Uh, you know I, I just take it all in as a complete thing. But I think that the thing that really threads the whole game together is the relatability. How. What Henry is, is the, the mystery that Henry is unraveling around Ned and Brian Goodwin ultimately speaks about his own circumstance and the fact that, that, that Ned, is, Ned is a reflection of, of, of Henry in a lot of ways in that they are both out in the wilderness kind of hiding from something. They are both out in the wilderness kind of running from something. Um, that that, that, uh, that they, they have had these... They have had these profound life-changing events occur to them in connection with uh you know with a loved one and now they are both out in the wilderness as a result of that and i i see that there i see that there's this interesting you know kind of parallel between what henry is is doing and what ned has done and and i find that very intriguing so brent let me let, let's back off the plot for a minute yeah. And let's talk about some other aspects of the game. Specifically, uh, I want to talk about mechanics. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have looked at this and said, I don't need another goddamn walking simulator. Uh-huh. Uh, how did you feel about the mechanics of the game? Well, I, I want to come back to the walking simulator thing last, because that is really going to be sort of like, to me, that conversation leads into my summation of the game. So I want to come back to that last. Okay. Um, but what I will say about the mechanics of the game, I love the... I love the fact that you hold down the shift button to transmit in quotes on the radio. You hold down the shift button, you select a response, you let go, just like you would, you know, hold down the button on a radio, say what you're going to say and let off the button. It's a simple thing. They don't need to do it. They can just, you know, have you mouse wheel down and and click a you know, click the the response you want. They don't have to do that. But even that that little bit, it just adds something. It just adds a little bit of flavor to the game. It it rings true. I guess is what I would say. And the thing that I think maybe the most profound experience I had with the game mechanics is when is on day two. This is me playing. This is not day two in the game. This is like day two of the Twitch stream, me playing the second, oh, okay. second half of the yeah. game. <laughs> yeah, does, <laughs> Let me be clear. Yes. yes, that's right. But my second play session with the game, I had read something online and I went in and I turned off the map indicator that shows your oh, position. So- one of the outlaws uh, actually posted that almost immediately, yeah. and I did that before even turning the game before I started my game. Right. So yep. I yep. I did that for the second half of my of my game, and it it completely changed the game in the positive. the The act now of orienteering and and navigating through the wilderness using just the compass and the map. And, and like people are telling me like, oh, hey, you know, like, if you hit the in key, you know, you can like have the compass up the whole time. And, uh, you know, like people were kind of like, help, you know, coaching me along because uh, I didn't bother to go into the settings and look at the key bindings. Yeah. But um, that that gameplay mechanic specifically, the finding your way around using just the map and compass, I loved. I absolutely loved that part. And I'm so glad that uh, that I, I turned that off and, and turned that part of the game into into gameplay as opposed to just a perfunctory okay where am i okay i'm going here 
it added so much more depth uh, than than I think would have been there otherwise. I agree, and I like I said, I did that before I even started the game, and I played the entire game that way yeah. um, for the, for the and, better, and I, definitely. And, and I completely enjoyed it. And um, uh, um, you know, beyond that, there's there's not much in the way of puzzle solving. Um, not really. I, I mean, not not in any physical way. They're, they're sort of you know, they're sort of information puzzles that you know you're kind of you know slowly putting the pieces together. But those are not right. Those are those are not dependent. But it's not to, it's not like you have to solve a puzzle to to get across no, I, here or to get to there. It's it, it's pretty classic. I mean, like you know, you need an axe to open the gate. You know, so you got to go like find an axe. Uh, you know, like it, it's it's kind of right. There were a couple times in the game where I was like, oh great, so they, game they the furthest point away from where I am. Yeah, and that's where you got to. So go. I have to run over there to get an axe to come back to the gate. Exactly. Like that was kind of annoying. But again, that's, that, um, but that's over, adventure game one hundred and one. But overall, uh, I, I thought they did a great job with the size of the world. They made it feel big, but you can still traverse across it in a timely manner. Yeah. Um, I, I thought the um, and it, and I, I really enjoyed like the, the map part. The amount of traversal you're doing is almost real time, as opposed to something like in Skyrim. You know, like where, where you're, you're you're traversing the equivalent of like dozens and dozens of miles on foot in a matter of you know like ten minutes or something like that. You know? Yeah, no, they, they, I think they did a really good job balancing like making it feel like real time, yeah. but obviously it's not. Obvi- um, obviously. Uh, so I, I thought that was great. I, I enjoyed finding the stashes. I enjoyed how you updated your map and the orienteering around that. Um, uh, the one thing that drove me nuts, it, it drove me fucking nuts, is is the repelling. And it wasn't the mechanic of repelling that bothered me. It was getting to places, what I thought were several places, where as somebody who grew up in the mountains of Colorado and yeah. you know Wyoming, that area, um, I, I get to places and I'm like, you don't need to repel down six feet. Right. Like, it looks like in the game it's six feet, so it doesn't occur to me to turn around and hook up a rope because why the hell would I rappel down six feet? Um, that and, and that happened more than once. Like on a few occasions, I was like, "That's ridiculous! I wouldn't rappel down. I can see a path right there to the left. I could just kind of slide down or whatever." Yeah. Um, but but no, I, I thought the gameplay in that way um, was was a, a good time. Um, the artwork, Brent, amazing. Uh, I thought. I thought it's unbelievably, unbelievable artistic direction. Amazing. Uh, so many pictures, so picturesque in yeah. so many ways. Really made me feel like I was in in Colorado, which is where I spent a lot of most of my time. Um, but it takes place in Wyoming. But but yeah, sim- just being that, that of feeling of terrain. that feeling of being in the mountains. Yeah. Um, was was really captured, uh, and I thought it was just an absolutely beautiful game. I loved the art style, the art style of the of the watchtowers. Yep. Um, it it's not photorealistic. At all, at all, no. not photorealistic at all, but so so aesthetically pleasing. And I was reading, uh, I was reading that uh, that apparently the, the sort of like the, the the visual style for the game had been had been taken for um, like uh, like National Park Service posters from back in the New Deal era, and right. and you know they were kind of like looking at that and saying, well, you know, what if you just sort of brought that to life in the world and made the world look like that and it, it's such, it's such a great fit i mean it really gives this game a distinct visual identity that uh that, that i i enjoyed throughout and commented on several times just how how beautiful it is and and it and it, it gets past any sort of it gets past any sort of feelings of like well i can't really immerse myself in this world because it's not photorealistic i never i never had that thought once Cross my mind at all at all and i i loved you know the setting of the game being out in a national park in america um is 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 just such a great setting i just i loved it i absolutely loved it i did too um brent i i think we would be you mentioned it earlier but i do i do just want to mention one more time because i think uh the voice acting was uh is so important to the game and some of the best voice acting i've i've heard in gaming i thought the two of them one uh, the guy who played Henry is from Mad Men. I don't know his yeah, name. Yeah, his name is uh, um, Rich Summer. Uh, and then uh, I do I don't know the woman who played Delilah at Her all. Her name is Sissy Jones. Uh, and I just thought they did a, a, just a fantastic, just an amazing job, and added yeah. so much to the game. It, it, it's it's terrific. I mean, it really is. It's some of the best writing and some of the best best voice acting of any video game I've played. It is so it it's so real. The the dialogue choices, the delivery. Even even through those high tension moments when you know when people are like really freaking out, it always feels grounded and real. It, it's it's a really really it's it's an achievement uh, in in the medium, in my opinion, on those levels. 
and I hope they get nominated for it along along with the soundtrack. I agree. Um, I agree. The the I'll, uh, nominated I'll, I'll where no, I don't know. I'll but. nominate them. Let's have the <laughs> um, let's have the, uh, the the horse kneecap awards. Uh, this will be the first year that we the outlaws have the horse kneecap awards, and I nominate Firewatch for three. <laughs> Um, uh, with that, Brent, I think maybe we can we can wrap up the discussion. I think you know I saw that uh, uh, I can't remember it might have been Polygon. I don't remember who wrote about Firewatch saying that it felt like an old friend and they, it felt like just a great movie and they felt they were confident they would go back right. and play it again in a couple of years or every couple of years or something. Right. And I could see that with this game just because it does feel so comfortable. Um, again, I, I think that uh, um, my first playthrough was significantly impacted. Uh, emotionally, the connect- connectability of the game emotionally with me was impacted because of my technical uh, experience with the game, and it's it's very very unfortunate. Um, I, I I don't I don't know how developers let a game go out like this. I really really truly don't because it's clearly such a labor of love, and it is just the worst possible showing for this thing that they've been working on for so many years, and, and it's it's really unfortunate, but. Um, but I did enjoy the game, um, and I'm really I'm, I'm glad that I played it. I, I am too, and you know the the thing that the thing that I kind of left with at the end, and this goes back to the whole walking simulator question that you asked me a few minutes ago. What I said when I finished playing the game is that I think that in Firewatch we see, or or, or at least I saw. A window into how storytelling changes as we move from the, the traditional mediums of like film and television and into VR. Firewatch is not as strong a game in terms of its mechanics as something like Journey, as an example. There is not a lot of gameplay going on in Firewatch. It is. It is a, a walking simulator to a, to a degree that's, that's a valid uh, critique of, of the game and its mechanics because you do a lot of walking in this game and you have some agency, but ultimately you don't have a lot of agency over what the game, over what happens in the game. There are game mechanics like the dialogue system, like the navigation that we talked about, but playthrough to playthrough, the the particulars of the story are, are not going to they're not going to vary too widely even though there are dialogue options and things like that it's not going to profoundly change the uh, the game experience at least in my opinion but the story is compelling nonetheless and i think that what is significant about firewatch is specifically in relation to vr is that as opposed to like watching a film where you know, the, the story and, and, and the shots, the composition, the editing, and all that is kind of filtered through the director. So that basically the director, in essence, is telling you this story in the way that they want you to experience it. Firewatch is a story that you discover for yourself. And the game mechanics allow that to happen. The, uh, the, the game mechanics allow you to experience the story at at a pace that you have some control over and they allow you to have a little bit of agency in, in choosing some of the beats that the story takes moment to moment. But ultimately I think that's what firewatch kind of represents for me. It, it represents this really interesting way of telling a story and using the medium of video games to tell a story that you experience and you discover in a in a different way than you would if this story were told in a book or in a film or something like that. Uh, but ultimately, that's what Firewatch is for me. Firewatch is a somewhat interactive story that that tells the you know that tells the tale of Henry and and Delilah. And I really really enjoy it on that level, and it makes me very very curious about what it would be like to play Firewatch in VR and what what lessons people who are developing content for VR might take from Firewatch uh, as, as we begin moving forward with this, you know, this new technology and this new way of telling stories. Well, certainly I think that, you know, VR is going to, is going to um, exact a, 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 um, 
a, a change around that because just the, the act of walking through the environment become, becomes a potentially compelling experience mm-hmm. uh, in and of itself. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting perspective as always. And Brent, as always, I'm going to tell the listeners that we want you guys to chime in on everything we talked about on today's show, whether it's Firewatch or or Firewatch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we really do. We really do want to hear what you guys think. Having played the game, uh, for those of you that are interested, let us know what your thoughts are on the game, on the the storytelling aspects of it, that voice acting, the music, um, the ending. You know, we we really would like to hear. We know a lot of members of the community out there have played the game, uh, and we're always grateful for your feedback. And with that, Brent, I think we will uh, wrap it up for this. I was going to say this week's. Who knows? We may have three more shows this week. It's hard to say. At this point. Uh, <laughs> for uh, for this episode of Outlaws to the End, which turns out to be our first postmortem in a long time. Uh, as usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, in the words of the great Will Rogers, always drink upstream from the herd. 